Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming here today. My name is Dr. Karen Keough, and I am here from Austin, Texas, where I practice with a group called Child Neurology Consultants of Austin. I do exclusively epilepsy therapy, and my entry into the world of CBD was gradual and step by step. I am now a chief medical officer of one of three, only three, licensed dispensaries in Texas. So I, I get the impression that the majority of people here are from California. You want to see a show of hands? Californians? Okay. Somewhere other than California. A few out there. A few. Um, Texas is very different, was very late to come to the game, um, and they have very restrictive laws about CBD in Texas. There are only three licensed dispensaries. Now in the era of hemp um, legalization with the farm bill this year, there's lots and lots and lots of CBD out there, but there are only three dispensaries. And until June of this year, the only um, way that you could get access to CBD therapy from a dispensary in Texas was if you had refractory epilepsy, defined as failing two medications. So it was very, very narrow initially. So that has been expanding. Um, and that has only been around for just under two years in the state of Texas. So it's still... Um, kind of evolving in acceptance and in use. The other thing that's unique about Texas is that you have to have a prescription from a physician to get access to the dispensary CBD therapy. And that, as far as I know, is, is the only state in the union that actually requires not only a medical marijuana card or some kind of a recommendation, the therapy actually has to be guided by a physician. And that's a very significant requirement because it can potentially really limit access to these treatments. On the other hand, I very strongly believe that that's the right way to do it. I think that these are very potent medicines and potent treatments, and it's something that should be done um, between a physician and the uh, provider who is guiding their therapy, not just for CBD, but for lots of other treatments. So mandating that the physician has to be involved is really important. And that means that the physicians who treat epilepsy in Texas had to learn a lot about CBD. And that is why I became involved in this process. And I was pulled into it through a patient who had a father who was involved with some other entrepreneurs who were applying for a CBD dispensary license, and they asked for my input. And I met with them and gave them a lot of input, and it just kind of grew into a relationship where I became involved in their business as well. And it's, it's been a very interesting process. I've learned a lot from it. And I've really become passionate about educating physicians and educating patients and families about this so that we can all do it better. And we are all still learning. We have so much to learn. Um, we have so much that is not answered um, with the research that's available out there, so many things we want to know. But we're really on the front lines of that. And, and that's why I do what I do. Um, I have over 200 patients who take CBD, either in the form of FDA-approved Epidiolex or dispensary CBD. That's not counting all of the patients who might be using over-the-counter CBD products. Most of my patients, I think, are telling me that because they know I'm pretty open to that conversation and I encourage people to talk about it. But a lot of patients don't talk about it with their physicians, and I think that's a really big problem. And I really want for that to be an open conversation. So that's kind of my perspective. I'm happy to answer any questions. That's who I am. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sean Hussein. I am a pediatric epileptologist at UCLA. And I specialize in infantile spasms and other forms of epilepsy, uh, you know, especially severe forms like lennox gusto syndrome. And there's a lot of use of cannabidiol in that situation. My potential conflict of interest is that a lot of my research support studying cannabinoids has come from industry, so especially GW Pharmaceuticals and Insys Therapeutics, which is now bankrupt. So maybe not so much of a conflict there. <laughs> uh, and I think we can have a pretty interesting conversation because I think we're coming from different sides of the table. Yeah. Hi, I'm Richard Tangwai. I'm a pediatric epileptologist at Loma Linda uh, University. I'm originally from Canada and just moved here about a year ago. And my experience in CBD has been, well, we don't have epidiolex in Canada, so we had to use the oil uh, products for it. 
And the biggest problem was, whether we liked it or not, patients were using us anyways. And we, the idea behind how I got in there was, you either follow or you stay ahead. And I decided to stay ahead. So we did a study in Canada, a nationwide study, multiple sites looking at a specific oil uh, extract of CBD. Um, and basically, uh, what we found was that it looks like it can be quite effective, but the biggest problem with the oils is you're not quite sure what's in there. And that's a big hurdle here in California now that I moved. But the oil extract can be quite effective. And what we've noticed was that maybe it's a combination of the cannabinoids themselves, which could be more effective than just having pure CBD or not. That's to be determined. That's the angle I'm coming from. And then because we finished our first phase of the study, we're about to embark on a second phase, which is an international study looking at the oil ex extracts. That's my angle there. Thank you. Okay. Well, it is a common frustration amongst patients and caregivers that, you know, my, I think it's changing in the last few years, but it used to be more common where we would hear from patients, oh, my doctor won't talk to me about CBD. They won't talk to me about cannabis. They, they won't tell me what to do or not to do. So I know that there are questions and comments. You have three epileptologists here who you don't have to pay for their time. <laughs> Thank you. So I would encourage you to think about your question. And while you're formulating what your question is, if I don't see a hand pop up, then I will ask a question which perhaps will be for uh, Dr. Tangway. With, with the research that you're doing on cannabis extracts, I know that Dr. Hussein has published a survey on oral cannabis extracts um, a few years ago, and one of the difficulties in interpreting that information is that you don't know what's in the products, um, and in that one it was observational, so it hadn't been studied. Are you trying to control for that in your study so you know yes. what combinations of cannabinoids are there? So you're probably going to have to answer into the mic because we only have the one mic. <laughs> Short answer is um, this started in about 2013, and it took us four years to find a supplier. And the reason for that was they had to fulfill Health Canada guidelines. So that's like FDA. So basically, it had to have a, su um, a supply that was consistent from batch to batch. And that was, we had a clear amount of CBD each time that we did it. Um, so that's why it took so long. So in our study, we looked at one supplier. Um, just to give you an idea of the steps it took for that supply, they genetically clone their plants. They have a set, uh, uh, a, a, a very um, filtered uh, greenhouses with filtered air. Uh, they also have purified their, their um, how they extracted was a certain, it's a different way than how it's generally extracted. And then they tested their product. And that's why we can get Health Canada approval. So yes, we did control for that. But the toughest, the biggest challenge was finding the right supply. Uh, that's, the, that's the toughest thing. OK, who's, who's going to be brave? Woman in back, thank you very much. Stand up so we can hear you, because we don't have a mic to pass around. So you're going to have to be, you're going to have to project. So which one of you wants to tackle the difference between CBD derived from hemp and CBD derived from marijuana? Thank you. Okay, so first we should probably define CBD, and that's an abbreviation for cannabidiol. But that abbreviation gets abused all the time to mean any cannabinoid <laughs> sometime. Um, so the, the first difference between marijuana and hemp, it's really the same plant, but plants and extracts thereof that contain very small amounts of THC. That, that what is counted as very small depends on which state or country you're in. But if that plant has very small amounts of THC, and that being the, the, the component of marijuana that creates the high, as long as that is very low, then you can call yourself hemp. But the actual chemical that comes from hemp or other plants that are classified as marijuana is exactly the same. Uh, but I think what we, we've alluded to is that there's a lot of difference between 
the various products out there that are advertised as CBD oils. You know, they have very different profiles in terms of other cannabinoids like THC that are in there, and as well as other profiles of other chemicals from the plant, including terpenes. So terpenes are the chemicals in the plant that give it its smell and its odor uh, and might be important for its mechanism of action. We don't know. Any rebuttal? Agreement. Uh, maybe I'll just sure. add one statement to that. So one of the reasons why that distinction between hemp and hemp plants and products that are derived from hemp plants versus products that are derived from um, cannabis plants that are not considered hemp is because it has a different legal status because of federal regulation. So United States law has now made it legal for people to sell hemp with very low THC content, but there isn't actually much verification, there isn't any regulation that requires verification that it actually did come from a hemp plant. It just, whatever's in the bottle, if it's low enough, then people will claim that it's from hemp. Um, so it's, a, it's an added layer of um, potential confusion um, that creates a way for companies to potentially circumvent some of the regulation that hits the cannabis industry because there's a loophole that allows them to function differently in the hemp world and allows them to now sell things and cross state lines and a lot of internet business that used to be very gray is now sanctioned because of the change in the hemp law. So that, that brings up an important question. How many people were from California? The bulk of the room? How many people traveled in? Okay. If they purchase CBD here in California, can they fly home with it? Maybe. The products that you, I guess, prescribe, are they the same as the ones where if I go to a store in California and go purchase, or is it different? It's a loaded one in the state of California, for sure. OK, so the, the first question was, can you fly home with cannabidiol? You absolutely can. It's not going to bring the, the plane down. <laughs> are, are you going to be arrested upon landing? Probably not. You know, this, you know, there, there have been cases you know, years ago where authorities like Child Protective Services have gotten involved and temporarily taken kids away. There have been situations like that. That has not been happening over the last couple of years. There is a lot of broad recognition that although a lot of these products are still technically illegal, especially those extracts that come from marijuana, per se, uh, there's a recognition that these products, uh, by and large, do have some effectiveness, if imperfect, and that those products inspired the development of FDA-approved drugs like Epidiolex. So I, I don't think law enforcement is you know, eager to try to target parents who are trying to treat their desperately ill children. What you should be more concerned about is whether the extract that you've bought has what it says it has in it. And that's, that's the tougher question. And if it doesn't have what it said it has, is it still safe for you or your child? And, and that's what should make everybody nervous. I, I wouldn't worry about the authorities. I would worry about the safety of the product. And it's just not that well established. I think there are two competing factors. One is that pure cannabidiol, like we see in the pharmaceutical product in Epidiolex, that appears to be pretty safe. You know, we have several thousand patients who have been taking it for several years. We haven't had any catastrophes. Overall, it, it looks pretty good. There are a few patients, maybe 5%, who are having asymptomatic liver problems, meaning there's a liver problem if you look at the blood test, but the patient looks fine. No one's dying from liver failure. And if you look at the overall safety of marijuana in general, it's actually pretty safe when you compare it to lots of other illicit drugs. But, you know, a lot of you, when we're in clinic and I tell you about other drugs, like, say, felbamate, I don't know if you've had this discussion with any of your physicians, this is a drug that has been linked to several deaths, and the risk is about 1 in 10,000 exposures. And I think most parents, when I say that, they say, oh my gosh, no, by no way in hell am I going to give my kid a drug that could kill them. But I'll tell you, we don't know if CBD is as safe as Feldmate because only a few thousand patients have used it in a supervised fashion where we really keep track of things. 
Uh, if there are similar risks with CBD, we wouldn't know it yet. We, we, we really need about 100,000 patients treated and supervised before we can say it's that safe. Over, sorry, what do you mean by the question? Oh. Uh, well, the longer they go without having bad side effects, we can say things like, ah, oh, well, the long-term safety looks good. And, you know, among X number of patients who have taken it for 20 years, the risk is Y. Um, at this point, we can only say things like, well, among the 3,000 or so patients who have been treated and supervised uh, over three years, uh, things are looking pretty good. And that's where we're at. And I would say that all of those numbers, I'm not trying to scare you about these statistics. You should remember that epilepsy is way more dangerous than all of these drugs. Okay, so don't worry about those risks. Go ahead. Let somebody else weigh in. Want to go for it? So there are the def several different layers of answering that question. So the first question is, what does CBD therapy bring to the table um, for each individual patient? And answering that question is an individual question. So even though we do understand from the Epidiolex trials what the response rate looks like for large groups of patients, every single patient's trial is going to be their own exposure um, to discern how will that patient respond. And the first thing we would typically do is add that to existing therapy. I think it is very common in patients that I meet who come to my office that people have high expectations for CBD therapy. They believe it will work better than any other medicine they've tried, and most people believe it will have fewer side effects and it will allow them to stop other medicines. And that's not true for any medicine that we use on a wide-scale basis for epilepsy. So we feel very, very... Um, you know, gratified when we find a medicine that we add to a patient's treatment plan and we're able to impact their seizures, get them down less and less, and every once in a while hit a really big home run and get the seizures to stop for whatever period of time. The reality is there's only about a 5% chance of that happening for any new medicine that we add in a group of patients where they are very refractory, where they have failed multiple, multiple drugs no matter what that is, and that's true for CBD therapy too. And when we do find a medicine that really does make an impact on seizures and the seizures improve, of course the next step is to see what can we now take away because we're always looking for an opportunity to simplify treatment. So if we have a patient who's taking more than one medicine and many of the patients who are using CBD are taking three or four or maybe even five medicines simultaneously, we want them on less medicine. We're going to take away, but we're only going to take away one thing at a time and only in very small steps. So you're not ever going to be in a position where someone would try and take away all three of those other medicines simultaneously. You would try and subtract one thing at a time. You would take small steps. And that's only after you've introduced the CBD and seen a benefit from it and realized, oh, this is really helping. Now we have an opportunity to try to take something else away. Does that answer your question? So we have information about many of the other seizure medicines and how they interact with CBD. And there's one medicine in, partic in particular, which is Clobazam, which a lot of patients with refractory epilepsy are taking on a regular basis before they add CBD. That is processed through the liver with a similar, well, the same enzyme that um, metabolizes Epidiolex or CBD. 
So the clobazam degradation process slows down, and that makes the level go up. That's very predictable. We know that that happens. Um, we also know that when you look at the approval trials, patients who took clobazam and CBD together actually had a really good response, and it seems to be even beyond just the fact that the level of the clobazam was higher. It seems that it is a really nice combination to have those two medicines together, but you have to be paying attention to side effects because you probably will have to adjust doses of clobazam if you add CBD. So that's very common. Other medications have less of a likelihood of increasing the levels, but there are some medicines where we have less information of how exactly the levels would change. And then if you go and you look beyond just other seizure medicines, but other medicines people might take for other kinds of medical conditions, some of which might be very important, chronic daily medication, that's one of the things that Dr. Hussein was mentioning, we're still learning about that and how this very new medication might interact with other medicines that are important. So I'm, I'm just going to build on that question real quick and then I'll come back to you. So you had mentioned, Dr. Hussein, that a lot of the other compounds that are on the market that aren't FDA approved don't always contain you know, what they say they contain. So I know that um, some of you are comfortable with talking to your patients about dispensary products, you have a whole trial. How do you manage the drug-drug interactions in the products that aren't FDA approved if, if you're not sure of the different molecules that are in there? I mean, there must be a practical way that you're doing it now. <laughs> I'll be very blunt with you. In California, it's hard for me to do that. Canada, I could because it was one supplier who I really knew what was in there. I was the, the supplier who supplied for our, our drug study in California, though, uh, because there's so many different companies. Um, it's very difficult for me to even comment on, on how to dose it. Some of them, the, I, I was reading one label. It just said, take two drops, and they have like an eyedropper. They don't say the, co the content of CBD um, like in terms of milligrams, so you don't really know what's in there, uh, let alone how much THC is in there. So it's very, like a... I'm still getting to learn about these products here in California. I've heard about the, the bigger name ones, Charlotte's Web being one of them, Miriam's Hope was another. But what do I know about them as compared to that other company in Canada? Hardly anything about it because that one we had to go through Health Canada. We had to have the, you know, the, uh, the studies done, how to quantify everything. These products I'm not sure about. Uh, so it's hard. I'll be very blunt. I can't comment on on. I have a very hard time making a decision about dosing with those products. Yeah, so I, I would echo the same answer that it's very difficult. The, the things we can do is make kind of good guesses. And the way you do that is by depending on parents to take a sample of the product they're using, and ideally a sample of every single bottle, and take it to a third party laboratory which can characterize the different chemicals from the plant that are there, whether the, you know, how much cannabidiol there is, how much THC, how much CBDA, how much THC, THCA. And that is not cheap. So I, I think one thing we haven't talked about yet is how expensive this product is, whether you're talking about Epidiolex or a community-sourced cannabidiol product. And aside from the cost of just having the medicine, the cost of making sure that it's what it says it is month after month is very costly. And there's the, the test, you know, the cost of the test, which is usually about $100 to $200 per test. And then there's the cost of the 5 to 10 milliliters of product that you need to supply to the laboratory. Um, and 5 to 10 milliliters is, you know, about a sixth to a third of each bottle. So you can imagine that that price tag is hard for a lot of people to sustain. Um, but that does give you, an, you know, a... I don't know if it's an effective means to, to, to follow the, the levels of the product, uh, but it's at least a starting point. The other thing that you can do, especially if you're worried about drug interactions, you can at least test the blood levels of the other drugs before, during, and after treatment with a cannabis product. You can also now test blood levels of cannabidiol. Uh, it's, it's harder to access those. They're not reliably paid for by insurance, but there are ways, are, there are ways to do this. You, you can be careful, but uh, you got to understand that you need to be willing to pay for these things and that it's going to be a lot of effort on your part. 
you know, because a lot of these products are still federally legal, there is some danger for healthcare providers to be handling these products and trying to do the testing themselves. You can imagine that some of your doctors are going to be wary of accepting your technically illegal product to try to characterize it. Uh, and it's not easy for us to do that. So there are three questions. There was one here, here, back there, and there. So actually, there's four now. So I'll come back to you. So I'll I'll take that because we've been. Um, carefully watching this in my practice. And I work with um, 11 other child neurologists in my group. Uh, three of them are also epilepsy specialists. All, three of, all four of us, the, the three other epilepsy specialists and myself, are registered for the Compassionate Use Program in Texas. And we all do some degree of prescription of dispensary-based products. Every patient that I have who might be eligible for Epidiolex therapy, I prescribe Epidiolex for them. So I have quite a few patients who have transitioned from dispensary CBD to Epidiolex. The majority of them are using Texas dispensary CBD um, because that's what I encourage everyone to do because of all of the concerns and qualifications of random CBD sourcing um, that we have, at least in Texas, because it is such a small number of providers, we have a lot more containment and a lot more insight into what those products really are. Um, the last time that I counted, I had 62 patients who had used dispensary CBD before they went to Epidiolex. About half of those patients had a, a similar response for seizure control or improvement and the majority of those who improved got better because they could take more medicine, because they weren't paying for it out of pocket anymore. Um, everybody gets priced out on buying dispensary CBD, um, especially if they're big. Now, I'm a child neurologist. We're child neurologists. Some of our patients are that big. And if you have a 10-kilogram child, you don't have to buy very much CBD. But if you have a teenager, then that becomes very expensive very quickly. So even my most resourced families are limited in how much they can buy because it's not short-term therapy as you know it's as far as you can see into the future and it's not just a car payment it's a really expensive car payment um, and not to mention other kinds of associated expenses like testing and things like that and levels and co-payments for insurance I mean it's just it's unmanageably expensive for long-term therapy um, so if you get to um, have the opportunity to transition to Epidiolex therapy and the insurance company absorbs the majority of that, then you might double your dose of CBD and guess what? It can work a lot better that way. So absolutely, it, it can be much more effective, mostly because of dosing and, um, and that can be excellent. About half of my patients have added back some dispensary CBD um, because there are some things that THC I think brought to them that um, the CBD product alone without THC does not do as well. And sometimes that is seizure control. Sometimes that was evident from a tiny decrease in THC content. Now, we're looking really closely at that because we want to understand that better. That's something that is not very well studied, and, and it's really important information. Um, it's something that should be studied in a more rigorous way, but it's, it's very difficult to do that in a controlled fashion because of all of the obstacles to trying to make that happen. Um, sometimes it's other kinds of side effects. So the benefit of sleep improvement, you know, THC is really good in helping you sleep. CBD sometimes is the opposite of that. Um, so there's a lot of different things that have an impact on that. And THC has lots and lots of potential detrimental effects that really have to be borne in mind if you're trying to utilize that therapeutically for a long-term treatment um, and very mindful of that. But again, epilepsy is a very dangerous condition. So we're, we're choosing what the risks are that we're trying to address. I think there was, did you still have a question in the front here? No, back in the back over here. Oh, behind you, she was, she was first.
So did you guys hear the question? Yeah. <laughs> First and foremost, you have to know what's in there. Um, so for me to advise on any company, I have to know exactly how much CBD THC is in there at the very, at the very minimum. Uh, a lot of these companies didn't always advertise that on their bottle, so you're not sure about the dosing. Uh, so that's number one. Make, um, I know about the other company in Canada because I know I mean, I went on tour into their facilities and so know everything there is to know about that company. But I want that degree of transparency so that if you're going to fork over, so the price range I've seen for per bottle ranges from 50. I think the most expensive was 250. You want to be sh absolutely sure you know what's in there and that they're consistent from batch to batch. So uh, I'm not sure how they report that in this country. In Canada, I, I would be expecting to see that, a, a breakdown of what's in there. Um, just to give you an idea about the company we went with, in, uh, so this is a company that genetically cloned their plant, had you know, filtered air and all that. They varied from batch to batch from 18 to 1, CBD to THC to 22 to 1. So even with all those controls, they varied. But at least we knew that. So when we dosed it, and we had a special lab that measured blood levels uh, at the University of Saskatchewan, so we could determine that. Here, you, it's much difficult to do that. Um, a lot of the companies, like that company is a multi-million dollar company. Money does play a factor. They had the resources to do that. Uh, here, I don't know. It's, um, it just seems like there's so many suppliers. But for sure, you want to be able to, uh, telltale sign. One bottle I looked at that a parent brought in to me, it had no information about how much CBD was in there. They just said take two drops and, or something like that. That's already a no. Right there. So if it doesn't have any specific details, I would stay away from that. But they have to have that kind of information. Sure. Yeah, I know it's a huge problem. And one of the problems is that there are legal risks for these companies to say exactly what's in their bottle. So even a lot of the name brand, big name community sourced cannabidiols out there. They won't tell you what's in there on the bottle. And it's on purpose because they don't want to expose themselves of having a little bit of THC in the product or too much. You can imagine yourself being one of the manufacturers of these products and saying that, oh, my batch has got a little over the legal limit. I'm not going to put that on the bottle. You know, I, I, I wouldn't put it past a lot of these manufacturers. I think a lot of them are benevolent and are trying to do the right thing. But I don't know that that spirit exists throughout the industry. And the, the only product in the United States that I would trust the content is Epidiolex. That doesn't mean Epidiolex is your only option, but you just have to be able to endure some other risks if you use a non-Epidiolex cannabidiol. So I want to um, address your concern about whether an adult can get approval for Epidiolex. So I think there's a perception that this is a pediatric medicine. This is not a pediatric medicine. Um, the two conditions that the FDA approved Epidiolex to treat are not exclusively pediatric conditions. Everybody with lennox gastaut and Dravet syndrome starts out as a child with epilepsy, and if they're fortunate enough to live to adulthood, which the majority of them will, they become adults with epilepsy. The problem is that sometimes they have not been recognized as having lennox gastaut or Dravet syndrome. So it's a matter of identifying that because if you can confirm one of those two diagnoses, it becomes very easy to get them approved for treatment with Epidiolex. It is also possible to get approval for Epidiolex if you don't have lennox gastaut or Dravet. And since I'm addressing a room full of patients, we can talk about this. This is called off-label treatment, okay? We treat people off-label for epilepsy all the time because we should and we must. Um, there are lots of medicines that are originally approved for lennox gastaut syndrome. Not a lot. Several. And it's become increasingly common in, in recent years. You will recognize some of them. Clobazam is one of them. It was approved for the treatment of lennox gastaut syndrome. Um, rufinamide, which is Banzel, was approved for the treatment of lennox gastaut syndrome. We use those medicines for other kinds of epilepsy. The trick is convincing insurance companies to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So there is a process to that, and the more that we ask, 
the more answer, the more times the answer will come back a yes over time. Because we always start with every new medication that comes to market. It comes under a narrow set of diagnoses from the FDA. And in ongoing clinical use, that will broaden over time. And the walls come down, and we have more opportunity to use that in related conditions, every other kind of epilepsy. Meanwhile, you know, there are other types of epilepsy that Greenwich is looking at to expand additional FDA approval. So tuberous sclerosis is on that list coming up pretty soon. Rett syndrome is a, another condition that they're studying. So there, there is an opportunity and the um, treating physician really needs to try to go to bat because the more we ask for it, the more we will get a yes for getting Epidiolex approved. Okay, middle of the room, you are super patient. Sure. I think the, uh, the challenge for, for consumers, as you're aware in California, there's unfortunately a lot of bad actors in the space, and it's hard to tell a legal dispensary from an illegal one, and it's hard to tell a valid COA from an invalid one. And I think we're all, including Greenwich, really hopeful that the federal government will step in and help out by regulating more standardly across the industry so people could have more confidence in the products that they buy at legitimate dispensaries. Those are good tips, though. Is there somebody over here? Yep. They say there's no such thing as a stupid question. We're all friends here, it's okay. What if you just smoke it? What do you what do you mean more specifically I'm like not, like for the effects? Because I know that they're saying the T T is something and C B D and the C B D is only the good stuff, so the T H C is not bad. But if you look at all the side effects of all the pharmaceuticals that they give your patients, it's still not as bad as if if it works, like if you I'm not saying you're yeah. So I think that I think the issues would be the the same regardless of mode of ingestion, though though obviously you get it in the system faster if you smoke it. So can I change your question just a little bit? Sure. And I just want to ask the panel. Is, so I, at, what I'm at Greenwich, I'm not related to the sales organization at Greenwich at all. I'm actually, I oversee cannabinoid education. So I deal with all of these issues and changes in terminology all the time. And one of the things that we've not been able to really figure out, so with FDA approved products, they are monitored once they come to market for those side effects. That's how we found out about felbamate and, and its side effect because it had to be regulated because it was FDA approved, had to be observed, side effects had to be reported. With cannabis-based products, as far as I'm aware, there's not a system right now to report 
side effects. Is there one in Texas? You guys have a more controlled system. So I think, I think I just want to be careful that you're not taking away that CBD is good and THC is bad. I don't think anybody's saying that. It's just CBD isolate, well, not even isolate, CBD in epidiolex is the only one that's been studied and FDA approved. So right now it's the only one getting monitoring. It's another kind of failure in the industry that we don't have a way to be measuring what the side effects are with different cannabinoids and different cannabis products and different modes of administration, which makes it really hard. I want to come back across to this question, but that's actually a really funny comment because the only cannabinoid that has an FDA approval for HIV and AIDS is THC. It's not plant-based, it's synthetic, but question here, or here, sorry, I'm not sure which one of you was first. I think it's not a simple answer, and it's going to be different for everybody. And the, and the first thing, I, I think you made an interesting statement. You said, well, we know that the CBD without the THC is going to make the autistic behaviors worse. But if you just take a step back and think about everybody who ever smokes a joint, their experiences are very different. A lot of people are chill. A lot of people are not chill. <laughs> and it, part of it is different products or different joints, but we're all different. And the effect of cannabidiol on each kid is going to be different. The effect of Keppra is going to be different on each kid. You can't make these generalizations. And if you're not in a good position in terms of your kids or your quality of life, sometimes you've got to be brave to make a, make a choice and, and try something different. Um, I also want to jump back to the not-so-dumb question. Um, so it's, it, it's the smoked cannabis experience for really millennia that inspired the development of all these products. So I don't think we should be afraid of smoking these products, but smoking these products introduces a lot of harmful chemicals. The, really, the smoke and all, all that stuff in there, no one thinks that stuff is good for you. Um, when you think about different populations who are using marijuana products to fight nausea or to increase hunger and to increase appetite, it is the THC component that seems to be better there. And although there is a synthetic FDA-approved THC that is effective for that, no one uses it. Patients with chemotherapy-associated nausea, vomiting, or who are wasting away with AIDS, they prefer to smoke the product because it works faster and, in their view, works better. There's, but that said, in the, in the epilepsy realm, there's no good evidence that smoking any of these products is more effective. So I'd say, yeah, there's no evidence there. It's much better to take it orally. I'm going to speak to the autism question because um, one of the things that changed this year in the Texas legislature in June was that they expanded the compassionate use program in Texas to include autism as a qualifying diagnosis. And that was a very big change. Um, we have very good evidence for CBD and using CBD for the treatment of epilepsy because of epidiolex trials. We have nothing remotely that solid for the treatment of epilepsy. It's a, it's a very limited um, 
world of research that has looked at autism. Not to say there's no evidence, but the studies are few, they're small, um, many of them are uncontrolled. So from a scientist's point of view, it's very hard to um, know how to apply that when a patient is coming to you and saying, my patient, my child qualifies for this compassionate use program, will you give us a prescription to try this in Texas? We'll pay for it. Um, it's, it's tough, but I've spent a lot of time trying to understand that better because we now have a lot of patients coming and asking for that. What has been studied, um, the most of, most of the trials that have been published so far, many of them come from Israel, where there's been a lot of research in CBD, and most of them have looked at that same um, level of CBD, high CBD, low THC combination for the treatment of autism, despite the expectation that that could be potentially provocative. Um, there are, are no trials that I have seen that look at CBD without any THC whatsoever. And there are a few um, studies that look at other kinds of combinations of therapy. So it's very challenging to try and make a treatment plan for epilepsy. It's a, it's a very empiric process. Now, because I do epilepsy, the patients that I'm treating who have autism also have epilepsy. And I'm treating their epilepsy first and foremost, and I've seen quite a lot of behavioral improvement in my patients with autism who are using Epidiolex or using dispensary CBD. So I, I believe there's, there's a lot to it, and very severe behavioral dysregulation in autism can be a very desperate situation. So it's something we need to learn a lot more about. Now, um, if you are looking at um, a patient who is fully controlled on treatment and you're thinking about, should I try something different? That's a big ask because there's a big risk there, right? The treatment that you're on is the devil that you know. So I'm going to let our moderator choose. So she had a question and then Dr. Sidekar and then back to the front here. Pure versus diluted CBD. What are you diluting it in? I mean, that, that, I think that's going to be pretty tough to answer because if you don't, you don't know the concentration yeah. mix per mil of your CBD, you know, you're talking about a rice grain. I don't know what that means in terms of mix per mil or mix per kig, which is how drugs are often dosed. So it would be really challenging to even answer that question, honestly. But I, I hear you about the, the glass dropper. I had not thought about that before, but it's so obvious. That, yeah. yeah. I would, be, I would caution you what we do know from the Epidiolex manufacturing studies that we've done is that CBD can interact with certain types of plastics. So I would be very careful about storing it in plastic. That's why Epidiolex comes in glass bottles, for example, because the CBD can actually bind to the plastic and start to leach the phthalates from the plastic. So about the, the thing, the yeah, if it's just for a moment, yeah. If you're going to use it right away and not store in it, then it's probably fine. in a glass bottle. There is also a plastic syringe, but you're meant to use it, you know, fairly soon within putting it in the syringe. Dr. Sankar? Mm 
Mm-hmm. Right. Secondly, coming to treatment of acute cases, I think at the moment the only data we have are all for gender. That sounds, yeah. I, I don't think the approval of CBD for epilepsy means it's appropriate to put in the proper for a rescue. Acute yeah, I, I, I. Is anyone else on the panel using? Any formulation of CBD for rescue therapy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would. I would be concerned about that because the PK profile is that it it takes two and a half to three hours to peak. So that's sort of an odd choice as a rescue. Mm -hmm. But all of them are leveraging the data that already exists for the ethic and use of mm -hmm. the drug to match the PKA profile, you know, for the mm -hmm. That's what we should do. And I think the use of cytocannabinoids for acute cases is far fetched and fantasy. Yeah. And some of that just to. <laughs> Just to <laughs> draw the analogy back, so benzodiazepines have relatively quick t time to be at their peak plasma concentrations, and that's why they are typical rescue therapies from when you're having a seizure emergency, whereas CBD is a very slow time to peak plasma level, so it's not usually used that way. Yeah. Question in the front, and then I think we're probably out of time, so we'll do two more. I'll do one here, and then the hand I just saw at the back. Depakote by itself. We'll probably, just because of time, we'll have to make this the last one, but perhaps we could take more questions at the back of the room. Just other, pe other people are starting to trickle in, so perhaps we'll take this as the last question and then thank the panel. Uh, so cannabidiol in any form is really to prevent seizures, not to treat an ongoing seizure. So although there are certainly folks out there who are giving it orally or even rectally during a long seizure, no good evidence to say that that's a, a good approach. And that by doing that, you're depriving yourself of an opportunity to use other drugs that are good rescue therapies. Thank you. <laughs>